so we are going to start with the page number 100 the third objection to the admission of women to political or professional life its alleged hardening tendency belongs to a new age now past and is scarcely to be comprehended by people of the present time. There are still, however, persons who say that the world and its evoked cashews render men selfish and unfeeling, that the struggle, rivalries and collisions of business and of politics make them harsh and, harsh and unamiable, that if half the species must unavoidably be given to these things, it is the more necessary that the other half should be kept free from them, and that to preserve women from the bad influences of the world is the only chance of preventing men from being wholly given to them. So this is what the argument is that you know man becomes harsh and uh, uh, he is less into emotion because he has to deal with politics and the pressure of the world. So that is why women are being kept away from all these. Uh, politics and business and also they could be uh, polite and uh, more sympathetic and lovable and loving uh, emotional that's what the argument which is given is uh, absolutely fake and bogus uh, there would have been plausibility in this argument when the world was still in the age of violence when life was full of physical conflict and every man had to redress his injuries or those of others by the sword or by strength of his aim women like priests uh, by being exempted from such responsibilities and from some sort of accompanying dangers may have been enabled to exercise a beneficial influence. But in the present condition of human life, we do not know whether these hardening influences are to be found to which men are subject and uh, from uh, which women are present, uh, present except. Uh, individuals now and these are seldom called upon to fight hand in hand. Even with peaceful weapons, personal enmities and rivalry, uh, rivalry, rivalries count uh, for little in worldly transactions. The general pressure of circumstances, nor the adverse will of individual, is the obstacle man and now have to make head against. That pressure when excessive break the spirit and cramps and shows his feelings, but no less of women than of men, since they suffer certainly not less from it's civil. There are still quarrels and dislikes, but the source of them are changed. The feudal chief once found his bitterest enemy in his powerful neighbor, the ministers of courtier, or in his rival of place. But opposition of interest in active life, as the cause of personal animosity, is out of the date. The enmities of the present day arise not from the great things, but small, from the people of save one another more than from what they do. And if there are hatred, malice, and or un uh, charitable names, they are to be found among women fully as much as men. In the present state of civilization, the notion of guarding, guarding women from the hardening influences of the world could only be realized by secluding them from society altogether. The common duties of common life, as, as at present constituted, are incompatible with any other softness in women than weakness. Surely, weak minds and the weak bodies must are now cease to be even supposed to be either attractive or amiable. But in truth, none of these arguments and considerations touch the foundations of the subject. The real question is whether it is right and expedient that one half of the human race should pass through life in a state of forced subordination to the other half. If the past state of human society is that of being divided into two parts, one consisting of persons with a will and substantive existence and other of human companions to these persons, attached each of them to one for the purpose of bringing up his children and make his home pleasant to him. If this is the place assigned to women, it is but kindness to educate them for this, to make them believe that the greatest the good fortune which can be for them is to be chosen by some man of for this purpose, and that every other career which the world thinks happy or honorable is closed to them by the law, not of the social institution but of the nature and destiny. So you know what is being understood or made understood to the women that other sole life of the purpose is that some man is choosing them. You know, some man is choosing her to take care of his family, his home, his children. That is what the training is given to women. When however we ask why the existence of one half of the species should be merely ancillary to that of the other, 
So that the question arises that why half of the population is made dependent on other? That is, women are being made dependent on men. Why each woman should be mere appendage to a man, allowed to have no interest of her own? There, that there may be a nothing to compete in her mind with the interest and his pleasure. The only reason which can be given is that men like it. It is agreeable to them that men should live for their own sake and women for the sake of men. This is a very significant statement and I guess you should remember it. It's on page number 107. Man, uh, that men should live for their own sake and women for the sake of uh, men. And the qualities in conduct and subject which are agreeable to rulers, they succeed for a long time in making the subject themselves considered as their appropriate virtues. And uh, hell be cheers has met with much oblique key for asserting that persons usually mean by virtue the quality which are useful or convenient to themselves. How truly this is said of mankind in general and how wonderfully the idea of virtue set afloat by the uh, powerful are caught and imbibed by those under their dominion is ex exemplified by the manner in which the world were once persuaded that the supreme virtue of subject is loyalty to kings and are still persuaded that paramount virtue of woman is, is loyalty to men. So what is still and are still persuaded that the paramount virtue of woman is loyalty to men. Note this point carefully and are still persuaded that the paramount virtue of womanhood is loyalty to men. Under a nominal recognition of a moral code common to both, in practice self-will and self-assertion form the type of what are designated as manly virtue, uh, while apt negations of self, patience, resignation and submission to the power unless uh, when resistance is commanded by other individuals than their own, have been stamped by the general consent as a pre-eminently pre the duties and grace require of women. The meaning being merely and power makes itself the center of moral obligation that a man likes to have his own will but does not like that his domestic companion should have a will different from his. We are far from pretending that in modern and civilized time no reciprocity of obligation is acknowledged on the part of the stronger. Such as assertion would be very wide of the truth. But when reciprocity which has disarmed tyranny at least in the higher and middle classes of its most revolting features, yet when combined with the original level of the dependent conditions of women has introduced its uh, turn as uh, serious evils. In the beginning and among tribes which are still in a primitive condition, women are enslaved of men for purpose of toil. All the hard boiled bodily labor de uh, devolves on them. The Australian savages idle while women painfully dig up the root on which she lives. So this is how the women are being put in the physical labor. And American Indians when he has killed a deer, leaves it and sends the woman to carry it to home. In a state somewhat more advanced in Asia, women were and are the slaves of men for purpose of sensuality. In Asia, women were and are the slave of men for the purpose of sensuality. In Europe, there early succeeded a third and mighty dominion, secure not by law, not by locks and bars, but by seclusion, seclusion inculcation in the mind, feeling also of kindness the ideas of duty. Such a superior or inferior under his protection because more and more involved in the relation. But it did not for many ages become a relation of companionship, even between unequals. The life of the two persons, the resting place to which the man returned from business or pleasure, his occupations were as they still are among men. His pleasures and ex excitements also were for the most part among men, among his equals. He was a patriarch and a despot within four walls. He was a patriarch and despot within four walls. A man is a patriarch and a despot within four walls. A man is a patriarch and despot within four walls. A man is a patriarch and despot within four walls. An irresponsible power has its effect, greater or less according to this disposition, in rendering him domineering, exciting self-worshipping, when not capriciously or brutally tyrannical. But if the moral part of his nature suffered, it was not necessarily so. In the name degree, in the same degree with the intellectuals and active portions, he might have as much vigor of mind and energy of character as his nature enabled him and as circumstances of his time allowed. 
He might write a prayer that is lost or win a battle of Marengo. This was condition of the Greek and Romans and of the modern until a recent date. This relation with their domestic subordinates occupies a mere corner. Though a cherished one of their lives, their education as man, the formation of their character and faculties depend mainly on a different class of influences. It is otherwise now the progress of improvement has imposed on all possessors of power and domestic power among the rest and increased and increasing sense of correlative obligations. No man now thinks that his wife has no claim upon his action but such as he may accord to her. So a man thinks that his wife doesn't have any claim on his action but he has the extremely powerful uh, I mean, uh, you know, concern or to say uh, for her behavior. Old man, the consigned believe that the duty to their wife is one of the most binding of their obligations. Nor it is supposed to consist solely in production. In the present state of civilization, women have almost ceased to need. Uh, it involves care for their happiness and consideration of their wishes and not unfrequent sacrifice of their own to them. The power of husbands has reached the state of the power of king has arrived. So the power of husband has reached the state which the power of king had arrived. The power of husband has reached the state in which the power of king had arrived. When opinion did not question the rightfulness of arbitrary power, but in theory, and to a certain extent in practice, condemn the selfish use of it. This improvement in the moral sentiment of Mankind has increased sense of the consideration due by every man to those who have not uh, but sincere to look to has ten, uh, tended to make home more and more the center of interest in domestic circumstances of society a larger and larger part of life and of its pursuit and pleasure. The tendency has been strengthened by the charge of taste and manners which have so remarkably distinguished the last two or three generations. In days not far distant, men found their excitement and fill up with their time in rolling body to exercise. Noisy merriments, uh, intemperance they have now in all but the very poorest class lost their inclination for these things. And for the course and pleasure generally, they have now scarcely and the taste but those which have in common with women. And for the first time in the world, man and women are really companions. A most beneficial uh, change if the companionship were between equals, but between uh, unequals is produced. What goods observe have not observer have noticed, though with perceiving its cause, a progressive deterioration among man in what either to be considered the masculine excellences. Those who are so careful that women should not become men do not see that men are becoming, and what they have decided that women should be are failing into the feebleness which they are so long cultivated in their companions. Those who are associated in their lives tend to become assimilated in character. In the present closeness of associations between the sexes, men cannot retain manliness unless women acquire. There is hardly any situation more unfavorable to those sentiments of elevations of character or force of intellect than to live in the society and seek the preference by sympathy or inferior sentimental endowment. Why it is that we constantly see this like so much of intellectuals and more from is followed by such inadequate performance? But because the aspirant has compared himself only with those below himself and has not sought improvement or stimulus from measuring himself with his equals or superiors. In the present state of social life, this is becoming the general condition of man. They are less and less for any sympathies and are less and less under any personal influences. But those of the domestic group, not to be misunderstood, it is necessary that we should distinctly disclaim the belief that women are even now inferior of intellects to men. There are women who are the equals in intellects of any man who ever lived and comparing ordinary women with ordinary men. The very though pretty details of which compose the occupation of most women call forth probably as much of mental ability as the uniform routine of the pursuit which are the habitual occupation of large majority of men. It is from nothing in the faculty themselves but for the pretty subjects and interest on which alone they are exercised that the companions of a woman such as their present circumstances make them so often exercise a dissolving, dissolving influence on high faculties and aspirations in men. If one or two has no knowledge and no care about the great idea and pers and uh, purposes which dignify life or about any of its practical concerns, personal interests and personal vanities. Her, consi her, 
her conscious and still more her unconscious influence will accept in rare cases reduced to secondary place in his mind if not entirely extinguish those interests which he cannot does not share our argument here bring us to collision with with what may be determining the moderate reformer of the education of the woman as sort of person who cross the path of empowerment on all great questions those who would maintain the old bad principles mitigating their consequences these say that women should be no slave no servants but companions so women should be companions and educated for that though they do not say that man should be educated to be the companions of women so if a woman is being uh, trained as a companion to man then men should also be trained as a companion to women but since uncultivated women are not suitable companions for cultivated men and a man who feels interested in things about and beyond the uh family circle uh, wishes that his companion should sympathize with him in the same in this in, in that interest they therefore say let women improve their understanding and they acquire general knowledge cultivate poetry art even conquer with science and some stretch their liberal liberality so far to say inform their views on politics not as pursued but sufficiently to feel an interest in the subject and to be capable of holding a conversation on that with the husband or at least of understanding and imbibing his wisdom very agreeable to this no doubt but unfortunately the reverse of improving it is from having intellectual communion only with those to whom they can lay down the law that so few men continue to advance in wisdom beyond the first stage the four most eminent men wish to grow if they associate only with the disciples when they have overtopped those who immediately surrounded them if they wish to further grow they must seek for others of their own stature to consort with the mental companionship which is improving is communion between active minds not their conduct between an active mind and passive this in estimable advantage is even now enjoyed when a strong minded man and a strong minded woman are by a rare chance united and would be had far oftener is education took the same pains to form strong minded women which it takes to prevent them from being formed the modern and what are regarded as improved and enlightened modes of education of women are jure as far as words so as education of mere show and prefers to aim to exalt instruct but mean that by expression to give superficial information on solid subject except accomplishments which are now generally regarded but as to be taught well if taught at all nothing is taught to women thoroughly small portions only of what it is attempted to teach thoroughly to the boys are the whole of what it is intended to desire for each to know women what makes intelligent being is the power of thought the stimuli which call forth that power are the interest and dignity of thought itself and a feel for its practical applications both motives are cut off from those who are told from the infancy that thought and all its great applications are other people's business while theirs is to make themselves agreeable to other people high mental power in women will be but an exceptional accident until every career is open to them and until they as well as men are educated for themselves and for all for the world not one sex for the other in what we have said on the effect of inferior position of women combined with the present constitution of married life we have thus far had in only the one most favorable cases are those in which there is some real approach uh, to that union and blending of character and live is the theory of the relation contents as its ideal standard but if we look at the great majority of cases the effect of women's legal inferiority on the character both of women and men must be painted in the far darker colors we do not speak here of the gross brutality or of the woman's power to seize on the uh seize on the woman's uh, earning or compare to the against the will we do not address ourselves to anyone who acquires who requires the proof that these things should be remedied we suppose average cases in which there is neither complete union nor complete disunion of feelings and characters and we affirm that in such cases that in terms of the dependence on the woman's side is demoralizing on the character of both the common opinion is that whatever may be the case with the intellectual the more influence of woman over man is always salutary it is we often do the great counteractive selfishness however the case may be as to pastoral 
a personal influence the influence of the position can immediately to promote selfishness the most significant of man and the whom can obtain influence or consideration nowhere else finds one place where his chief and hat there is person there is one person often greatly superior in understanding who is obliged to consult him and whom he is not obliged to consult his judge magistrate ruler over their joint concern are bitter he of all differences between them the justice or the science to where which are balance and edges the scale between his own claim and wishes and those of another is now the only tribunal a uh, tribunal in civilized life in which the same person is judge and party a judge and party a generous mind in such situation makes the balance inclined against its own side and gives the other not less more than a fair equality thus be the weaker side may be enabled to run very fact of dependency into the instrument of power and default of the justice taken in an ungenerous advantage of generosity rendering the unjust power to those who make an unselfish power of it dominant and brother and now it is when average men are invested with this power without reciprocity without responsibility give such a man the idea that is first in the law and the opinion that to will is his part and has to submit it is absolutely supposed that if this idea may be the light over his mind without sinking into it and having any effect on his feeling in practice the propensity to make himself the first object of the consideration as a sense more second is not so rare as to be wanting here is everything seems uh, but was the arranged for for encouraging its indulgence if there is any self in the uh, decapitated the conscious, conscious and unconscious deposed of his own household the wife indeed often succeeds in gaining her objects but it is a same way of many various sorts of in that Customs harden human being to any kind of degradation by deadening the part of their nature which would resist it. And the case of women is this respect. Even the peculiar one could no other inferior caste than we have heard of being taught to regard that degradation as their honor. The argument, however, implies the secret consciousness that the alleged preference of women and their independent status is merely apparent and arises from their being allowed no choice. For if the preference of by natural, there can be no necessity for enforcing it by law. To make compelling people to follow their inclination, as not in other things, but though necessary by any, uh, any legislature, the plea that women do not desire any change is the same that has been urged time out of mind against the proposal of the abolishing any social error. There is no complaint. What is generally uh, not true, and when true, only so because there is not much hope of success without which complaint seldom makes uh, itself audible to unwilling uh, ears. How does the objector know that women do not desire equality and freedom? He never knew a woman who did not or would not desire for it uh, for her individuality. How does the objector know that women do not desire equality or freedom? He never know a woman who did not would not desire it for herself individually. It would be very simple to suppose that if they do desire it, they will say so. The pro the position is like that of the of the tenants or the labourer who vote against their own political interests to pleasure their landlord and employees, with the unique addition and submission is inculcated on them from childhood. As the peculiar attentions and grace of their character, they are taught to think. That to repeal activity, even an admitted injustice done to themselves, is somewhat unfeminine and had better be left to some male friend or protector. To be accused or rebelling against anything which admits of being called an ordinance of society, that taught to regard as the imputation of a serious offence, to say the least, against the proprieties uh, of their sex. Is a quite unusual moral courage as well as disinterestedness in a woman to express opinion favorable of an enfranchisement, uh, enfranchisement, until at, at least there is some prospects of obtaining it. the comfort of her individual life and her social obtaining it. The comfort of her individual life and her social consideration usually depend on goodwill of those who hold their undue power and to possessors of power in. A complaint, however bitter, of the misuse of it 
is a less fragrant act of insubordination than to protect against the power itself. The profession of women in this matter can be remain the minus of the state of offenders of the old who are part of institution used to protect their own love and devotion to the sovereignty, sovereign by whose unjust mandate they suffered. Grace Selda herself might be matched from the speech put Shakespeare into the mouth of male victim of kingly caprice and tyranny. The Duke of Buckingham, for example, in Henry the Eighth, and even, ho a even in Holsey, the literary class of women, especially in England, are ostentatious in disclaiming the desire for equality on citizenship and proclaiming their complete satisfaction with the place which society assigned to them, exercising in this as, in many respect, the most noxious the influence over the feeling and opinion of man who unsuspectingly accept the severity, servilities of the Judaism as the concession to the force of the truth, not considering that it is the personal interest of these women to profess whatever opinion they accept will be agreeable to men. It is not among men of the tale is sprung from the people and patronized and flattered by the aristocracy that we took for the leaders of democratic movement. Successful literary women are just as unlikely to prefer the cause of women to their own social consideration. The depend on men's opinion of their literary as well as for their feminine success. And such is their bad opinion of man that they believe there is not mere than one in ten thousand who does not like a fierce friend. Siri, serenity sincerity or high spirit in a woman. They are therefore anxious to earn pardon and tolerance of tolerations of whatever of these qualities their writing may exhibit on that subject by a steady display of submission on this that they may give no occasion for vulgar men to say what nothing will prevent vulgar man from saying that learning makes women unfeminine, learning makes women unfeminine and that literally the ladies are likely to be bad wives, which really ladies are likely to be bad wives. So this is what the patriarchal anti-feminine statement we can find here. Learning makes women unfeminine and that literally ladies are likely to be bad wives. But enough for this, especially as a fact which afford the occasion for this notice, make this impossible any longer to assert the universal act of acquaintances of women saving individual exceptions in their dependent condition in the United States. At least there are women seemingly numerous and how uh, organized for action for the public mind to demand equality in the fullest exceptions, expectations of the world and demanded by a straightforward equality men sense of justice, not plea for its with timid de depreciation of their displeasure. Like other popular movement, however, this may be seriously regarded, retarded by the blunders of its adherents. Tried by the ordinary standard of public meetings, the speeches at the convention are remarkable for the preponderance of the rational over the declamatory element, but there are some exceptions and things to which it is impossible to attach. Rational meaning have found their way into the resolutions. The resolutions which set forth the claim made in behalf of women after claiming equality in education and industrial pursuit and political right enumerates as forth out of the demand something under the name of social and spiritual union. And a medium of expression, the highest um, moral and spiritual use of justice, with other similar uh, but the age, serving only to mark the simplicity and rationality of the other demands. Resembling those who would weakly attempt to combine nominal e equality between men and women with enforced distinctions in their privilege and functions. What is wanted for women is equal rights, equal admission to all social privilege, not a position, a part, a sort of sentimental peace too. But this is the only just and rational principle, both the resolutions and speeches, for the most part, adhere. They contain so little which is akin to the nonsensical paragraph in the question that we suspect it not to be the work of the same hands as most of the other resolutions. The strength of this cause lies in the support of those who are influenced by reason and principles and to attempt to recommend it by sentimentalities, absurd, absurd and reason and inconsistence with the principles of which a movement is founded is to place a good cause on level and with a bad one. There are indications that examples of America will be followed on the side at the Atlantic. The first step has been taken in the part of England, where every serious 
uh, movement in the direction of political progression has its commencement the manufacturing distinct distinct district of north on 13th february 1851 abdijo women agreed to be to buy a public meeting at chef a uh, sheffield and claiming the elective franchise was presented to the house of lords by the alum charles lee charles lee thank you please subscribe the channel